still a staple of rock radio to this very day. The Seattle supergroup Temple of the Dog would release their only album in April of 1991. That was self-titled. What may surprise people is that the album wasn't a big hit initially and it stirred up controversy and bad feelings afterwards. That's what we're gonna discuss in today's video. Temple of the Dog would get their start almost a year before the record came out in March of 1990 when frontman Andrew Wood of the up-and-coming Seattle rock band Mother Love Bone would pass away due to a drug overdose. Former Soundgarden frontman Chris Cornell was friends with Wood and even lived with him for a period of time. According to Grunt Truck drummer Scott McCollum, who talked to Cornell around this time, he would reveal in the Mark Yarn book, Everybody Loves Our Town, I remember Chris being really pissed at Andy shortly after he died. I was really surprised by that. He was really mad and upset that he had done what he did. He was really hurt. Carnell, who was on the road with Soundgarden at the time, would immediately pen two tracks about Wood titled Reach Down and Say Hello to Heaven that would eventually make their way onto the Temple of the Dog album. Upon writing the songs, Cornell would provide demos of the tracks to Wood's girlfriend. Eventually, Wood's former bandmates in Mother Love Bone and future Pearl Jam guitarist Stone Gossard and bassist Jeff Ament would hear the tracks and be blown away. They would end up pushing Cornell to release the material. Cornell could recall, My initial thought was I could record them with the ex-members of Mother Love Bone as a tribute single to Andy. I got a phone call from Jeff saying he thought the songs were amazing and let's make a whole record. The record would be made up of material Cornell wrote and recorded and material the members of Mother Love Bone recorded before and after Wood's death. It was during the rehearsals that Cornell came up with the song Hunger Strike that he thought was a filler song to round out the album to 10 songs. Also present during the rehearsals was singer Eddie Vedder, who had just flew in from California to audition with Wood's former bandmates in a new group they put together called Mookie Blaylock that would eventually rename themselves to Pearl Jam. Cornell would remember, Eddie was sitting there kind of waiting for a Mookie Blaylock rehearsal and I was singing parts and he kind of humbly but with some balls walked up to the mic and started singing the low parts for me because he saw it was kind of hard. We got through a couple of choruses of him doing that and suddenly the light bulb came on in my head. This guy's voice is amazing for these low parts. History wrote itself after that and that became the first single. And Vetter would appear on the other tracks pushing forward back, Your Savior and Four Walled World. Also contributing to the record would be future Pearl Jam guitarist Mike McCready and Soundgarden drummer Matt Cameron. And while the album was meant to be a tribute to Andy Wood, it did create some bad blood as Soundgarden guitarist Kim Tile would tell author Mark Yarm, the initial purpose of Temple of the Dog to be a tribute to Andy Wood was not the concluding purpose. I think to be a tribute to Andy Wood, there were a lot of people who were close to Andy, like brothers who probably should have been involved. It became something else. It became a Chris Cornell solo record with some of his friends. He'd conclude. Andy's brother Kevin Wood would express some anger over not being included, telling the same author, I fully expected to be included in that project, although they never called me. I was really pissed off at the time. I didn't get to play on that or even considered to be asked. The band would record the record at Seattle's London Bridge Studios with renowned producer Rick Parishar, who in the near future would work with both Pearl Jam and Alice in Chains. Parishar and Cornell would end up getting into a legal battle nearly two and a half decades later. More on that later in the video. According to Gossard, the recording was non-pressure filled. The record would be done in about two weeks and nobody from the label was around to keep an eye out on the band and the band members paid for the whole thing themselves. The album would be released in April of 1991, months before Pearl Jam's debut record 10 and Nirvana's Nevermind. The album wouldn't get any traction until almost a year later in 1992. Amy Finnerty, who worked at MTV and was solely responsible for getting Nirvana's video for Smells Like Teen Spirit on the air, told her bosses in the program department about the band. Her bosses loved the record, called up the record company, and basically said, let's make this happen. The label reissued the Hunger Strike single and released an accompanying video and it catapulted the album up the charts. Hunger Strike, along with Say Hello to Heaven, would both be top five hits on the rock charts and the album would peak at number four. Ultimately, the album had a positive and some unexpected effects on Cornell's band Soundgarden, with Tile telling author Mark Yarm, Chris doing Temple of the Dog ultimately helped Soundgarden in that it got him to exercise some of his creativity muscles and bring that back to Soundgarden. 
It was bad that at some point, I think Temple of the Dog was out selling Bad Motor Finger. Guitarist Stone Gossard has held the album in high regards as it related to his career, telling Spin in 2001. I still listen to it and think that it's the best thing I've ever been involved with. Whatever that combination of people was, I'd never been in a situation where it was that easy. I've almost been looking for that ever since. The very first thing we did was a very high watermark and the way our two bands complemented each other. And it was a bunch of songs that Chris wrote totally from the heart. The members of the supergroup would play one-off performances with each other in the 2000s and 2010s. It was in 2016 that Temple of the Dog announced an eight-day tour, something that left a sour taste in Andrew Wood's ex. She slammed the tour and Chris Cornell for not giving her writing credit on the song Times of Trouble and accused Chris Cornell of stealing Andrew Wood's belongings, including lyric books after his death. She would write, Let's think about why the Temple of the Dog songs were written. Were they not written to console me and others over the loss of Andy? Chris gave me a cassette of songs and told me, these are for you about Andy. Then Jeff and Stoney heard them. They asked Chris about the songs and went on to record them with the broken promise that all the money would go to charity. That of course never happened. This wasn't the only controversy over the group, as in 2014, Chris Cornell and the record label A&M Records wanted to re-release Temple of the Dog's sole album in 2016 for its 25th anniversary. But the label learned that Cornell and his bandmates never had the master tapes. Both parties would be in dispute with producer Rick Parishar's brother, who still had the master tapes. Rick had passed away the same year. Prior to the dispute Cornell and his label claimed, Parashar never honored a 1993 agreement in which he would hand over the tapes for $35,000. Eventually a deal would be worked out. Sadly, in 2017, Chris Cornell would pass away, dashing hopes of any future Temple of the Dog reunion show or new material. That does it for today's video guys and thank you for watching. Be sure to hit the like button and subscribe and we'll see you again on Rock and Roll True Stories. Take care.